Okay, what's going on, guys? And welcome to a brand new episode of Energize. Today, we have a very special guest on the show. We have Lions legend, England legend, and future Bellator legend, James Haskell. James, how are you doing? Very well, lads. I'm not sure about that last part. Let's... Well, I'm not sure about any of the legends we part. I think we play the word <laughs> legend around a lot, but um, I will take rugby Kino in my former life. Now, I don't know what. Now I'm an unemployed cage fighting DJ. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I forgot DJ and I'm a ce celebrity legend as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But again, and again, not legendary. I mean, I, you know, I got voted out after losing the plot because I was so hungry, but then luckily saved by my campmates and. It could put you know it talked about in glowing terms, which is great because that could have been quite a fall from grace, unfortunately. Yeah, in fairness, yeah. just with the current situation with uh, sort of the coronavirus going around, are you sort of used to the isolation after being a celebrity? Do you know what? I'm I am quite a loner as it is anyway. Like, I obviously live with my wife. Um, I always prioritize work and training over being social, it's to my detriment of friendships or whatever, but I've always done that. Um, I actually quite like this. This is like being on a holiday for me. I'm like never on holiday normally. Uh, I always, I'm a workaholic. So what I'm missing performing, so all the stuff that I normally do is like DJing, speaking, there's obviously going and training and doing, you know, the cage fighting stuff. But I'm actually pretty happy to be honest with you. I quite enjoy it. I'm busying myself. I'm doing live stream DJing, live stream workouts, you know, doing my House of Rugby podcast, uh, doing, po I mean, I've done, I've got four podcasts to record today. You guys being one of them, I've sort of just everyone that's ever sent me a message about podcast. I just said my PA right, tell them we can do it now instead of because every because a lot of people get precious about doing it in person. Yeah, people don't want to do it, but you can't do it anymore. So now's the perfect excuse to put your pressure just to one side and just get it done. Yeah, yeah. Like we've had we've had some people on the show. Like for instance, uh, we've had Greg O'Shea and we've had Tommy Bow on the show in the last couple of days as well. It's great to just for people to just speak to other people, you know, rather than being totally in lockdown. Well, uh, James, where exactly are you based right now? Uh, I'm in Northamptonshire at the moment. Uh, so I'm in my house in Northampton. Um, it was a ha I basically, when I played for Wasp, and we moved from Wasp, we from High Wycombe to Coventry. It's the same house. And then when I signed for Northampton, I'm actually even closer to them. So it was the perfect crime. Um, so I'm just, um, yeah, just, just chilling. My wife's uh, working on, she just launched a new website, chloemadley.com. She's finishing her fourth book. Uh, we train together. We, you know, we eat together. I'm quite enjoying it. We have, um, you know, what, what, the only thing is I haven't had a drink since the 27th of December waiting for my fight. I mean, my fight's still on May the 16th. I'm training every day. I have a, a slight injury at the moment, which is limited what I can and can't do anyway. But I'm pretty sure um, the fight's probably not going to go ahead at the moment. So I haven't had a drink the, since the 27th. But I may have given in and had a bit of wine because that is the problem. You sit around, you're like, how do you avoid the day drinking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, to be honest, like I, I would like I would be more of a social drinker. So like sitting in, not drinking is fine by me. You know, I'd never. Yeah. Oh, normally that's fine. I'm, I'm great. Like I have for months, I never missed it. But when my wife puts her head around the door and goes, "Why a movie night?" I'm like, "No, no, I can't. I can't. Oh, okay, go on then. I can. I can." Yeah. Um. So, you know, that that is the uh, uh, I'm training every day. And I see you've been uh, doing a bit of cat napping on the couch there, uh, James. Uh, I saw you got caught out. <laughs> my wife, the miss was doing you dirty, she was, wasn't she? Yeah, she, so listen, my, look, if I did it the other way around, she'd get her knickers in a twist. But I am the constant victim to my wife's crap pranks. That actually being relevant for this podcast was, that was when I was caught with my, my pants down, literally lying on the bed. That's when I come back from my first session of the day, having done full on sparring and was having to go back in the night to do ground and pound stuff with Carlos Favola um, uh, and Aranus. Uh, and I was so tired and fucked up in the first session, I couldn't be asked to take my trousers off. And that was, that was sleeping. But what she did is, because she's, <laughs> she she's a nasty piece of work, she put a montage together and completely did me, implying that that's what I was like in, um, you know, in, in quarantine, which I don't think is a bad thing to be. But actually, no, sadly, it was all a, a, a stitch up. Yeah. Uh, apparently, yeah. If, if your wife's not going to give you a stick, who will? Exactly. But she's yeah. got to be prepared for revenge because I will seek revenge. I will take my time. <laughs> it will be good and it will be just and it will be horrific. You'll bring her in. You'll, you'll have to fight her on, the, on that Bellator card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James, James, the sort of format we wanted to go through was obviously get the I'm a Celebrity stuff out of the way because people are going to obviously want to hear about that. Uh, then move into your England career and then we'll go into the MMA stuff. Is that okay with you? Whatever you want. Perfect. So like you're obviously on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. Uh, How did that even come about? 
I'd actually been asked to do it a couple of times before, um, but I, I was still playing. It was never going to be possible. I don't think it was the right time. Um, I've been approached to do Strictly as well. And I basically, uh, I'm not very good at dancing. I've obviously had lower limb injuries from playing. I didn't think it was a great idea. I, I didn't think it was going to showcase me in the best possible way. I never wanted to do um, reality TV. It never occurred to me. The opportunity arose and I just finished retired from rugby. I hadn't yet signed the Bellator contract and I was basically quite keen to to do something to, you know, to, obviously all my stuff is kind of uh, public facing. So you need to have a bit of a profile to get booked as a DJ because I'm not known as, as for good being a good DJ, even though I am a DJ properly and I'm constantly evolving my my technique, etc. Uh, people book me because I'm Jace Haskell, ex-rugby player. So going on to I'm a Celebrity, you put yourself into 14 million people's houses yeah. uh, every night. It's it's such a big show, and it was such a privilege to be asked that I decided that I wanted to to give it a go. Um, obviously, one of the things to talked about start was the food, you know, and I was told I was told what turned out to be you know more of a fairy tale than Disney created about <laughs> food and nutrition because um, you know nobody in, nobody outside professional sport or health and fitness really understands nutrition you see what people buy from supermarkets you see how people talk about food you see how people struggle to gain and lose weight and people in tv turn out have no idea about nutrition either so that was yeah. a bit of an eye opener. yeah because you're a big guy as well when we saw you at bellator i was like geez that fellow's a monster i was yeah i was 122 kgs when i went into that was two two six five two six seven something yeah like you're that. right on that heavyweight limit aren't you yes yes uh, but then i came out of the jungle and i was 110 and then um, I basically sat around about 117. And then because of the amount of training calories and stuff that I was consuming, I, um, and basically I was burning about 2,500 calories a day doing the MMA stuff. I upped my calories about five and a half thousand. So since I've got, uh, finished, I've kind of adapted, but I'm using this opportunity to put on a little bit of weight. So if I go back into training, when I go back into training, it'll, um, it'll come off me, but I, I'll you know, be slightly bigger than I was because I want to go in there right at about 120. I don't want to go in kind of under because I don't think I need to. One thing I must say, James, from watching The Jungle was uh, when it really came down to the food, I felt like they tried to make you out to be some sort of bad guy. And you know when you're doing the challenges about the questions and you're like, hands up, who wants this? Hands up, who wants that? I didn't understand why they wanted to talk about that for about four hours. You know what I mean? It was like, Seven is a bigger number than four, so therefore seven wins. You know what I mean? Like you, you were so straightforward about it. And then everyone else seemed to like think you, you were like almost Bullet. Hitler for for like yeah. adding up a few numbers. Yeah, so, it, so basically, yeah, so basically it, it's one of those weird situations. So if you've ever watched that TV show like The Island or whatever it is, they always get these contestants or, or people or whatever on these on these shows. And the first thing people do on like The Island, for example, is go, let's go and find a great beach. Let's go find a great beach. So instead of like setting up shop, getting food, building a shelter, they walk all the way through, takes them a day, they drink all their water, they get to a beach, realise it's, it's, it's amazing, but no, no good. It gets to night, they've got no food, they've got no nothing, they can't, they can't do anything. And, and somebody will go, well, we need to pitch camp. And at the back you'll hear, who put you in charge? And there's always some <laughs> people that just don't want to ever have any like leadership. And the thing with it was, A, we were starving. You know, I was eating, I mean, so I was having five spoonfuls, so that's uh, tea, uh, dessert spoonfuls of uh, rice in the morning, five um, teaspoons or, or a tablespoons of, or what they are, dessert spoons at lunch, right? I put them into my fitness power, that's 89 calories. Of, of rice and beans, right? Say you put some cooking oil into it, that's going to push it up to about 100, 100 calories. So, so I was eating 100 calories for, for most of the day um, and expected to kind of survive. So, so listening to my campmates, God bless them, debate an undebatable question and get the voting wrong twice and then to be told <laughs> that we've got all the time in the world when the sooner they answer it, the sooner we get the treat if we got it and the sooner we can move on with our lives. Um, and I just, I'm, you know, in my career, Everybody in, in, my, in rugby and sport, and everybody, everybody deserves an opinion. Everybody should be able to share. But at some point, after everything, you have to make a decision. And I, unfortunately, you know, if I had aspirations to win that show, I mean, I didn't go in it to win it. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't even know you get King of the Jungle Queen. I didn't pay much attention to it. And I never watched any of it. Um, I, you know, I made a decision and basically said, look, you've got to do this, got to do that. And people said I was a bully. And, you know, people said for making women go first, that I was a chauvinist. Like, you can't win. Everybody in 2020's default position is, I'm offended, change my mind. I was brought up properly. I've got good manners. I know what's going to do. I slept on the floor for six nights 
out of my however long because I wouldn't want to take Kate Garroy's bed. I didn't want to take food off other people. I did what was best. And luckily, my camp mates, as I, when I left, all came out and said, you know, he was someone that I relied on. He was someone that got me through it. He yeah. took the heart out of the camp. He was the best, da, 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 which completely changed, transformed it because I could have come out of there labelled a bully as they ran in the, in the headlines and never worked again. But luckily, I was, I was saying well, I made friends for life, you know? I must say, I actually thought everyone just ended up being so nice in that season that they had to find a bad guy. And they were like, right, we can edit this and make James Haskell the bad guy. And I thought Andrew Maxwell was like, I am the number one victim here. I feel victimised. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he, he just thought you were supposed to be funny. When Andrew oh. came out, he was like, um, he went, um, I think James should win. Adele came out, she said, I think Hash should win. People came out, and then I was going really well, apparently, and as I said, I've not seen it. And then they just had one day where, you know, for, for Andy's group, for, for the greater good of the camp and for Andy's mental health, telling him not to keep asking about the roast dinner he wasn't going to have and didn't eat and missed out on. Oh, you've had a go at this, you know. Cliff asking me to, to throw the thing because he wanted to leave the camp and me getting filmed nodding to Caitlin going yeah don't worry I'm going to film it and not stitching not stitching miles up and getting him thrown out everyone's like you've thrown Cliff off EastEnders is out of the camp you know Cliff's doing an interview going I know James will do his best for me and I'm like Cliff we had a conversation on camera where you told me to throw it you don't want me to win and now you're making me out so yeah they 100% edited me out as they wanted to but that's the that's the that you can't be bitter about that the you know uh, Roman and Jacqueline who won all fantastic anybody could have w- w- won that my only concern was is that you know editing away in a certain way you can damage your career for life and never work again and I think yeah. you know they went after me and Ian, Ian pretty quickly once we'd served our purpose of being entertaining and they kind of have a narrative but that's the nature of those shows um, yeah. and intelligent people understand that bottom feeders and people who don't understand anything think that's real life and it's uh, and it's like it's a tv show we, we were trapped where you saw us. We got no extra food. We were bored out of our minds. We sat there. We did some cool challenges. Everything you saw is what it was, but it's still a TV show. That's 24 hours cut down into an hour show. That's yeah. it. Well, that's the thing. As a leader as well, James, like, I mean, you, like, someone has to step up and be like, right, everyone, let's stick together. Because I'm sure people, like, like, there's obviously mental health issues going on around the world. Everyone could be affected. If you're in a remote island, can't even look at your phone, can't look at the TV, can't read, can't, barely eating, someone needs to take charge mate and that and that's how i got myself in it i went in there i went in there and nobody knew like basically had no idea about who i was right had no idea about me um you know rugby no one asked me anything about rugby all we did is my, my so i didn't have to be the, the big character that i normally am like showing up. all i had to do was be nice put my arm around support people and that's what got the best out of me i just carried on being yeah. busy was tried to be paternal and fraternal to people help everyone out and that was the way i did it and do you know what i um I really enjoyed that part of it. And it was quite nice. And when I came out, people were like, I met my friends and they were like, Hass, you, you haven't taken the piss out of me in about 20 minutes. Are you feeling all right? We don't like this new version of you. And I'm like, I'm oh, sorry, guys. I'm just, just kind of a nice guy these days. And then obviously that was <laughs> often. <laughs> and how many of those people did you actually know going into that show? None. What about Ian Not Wright? Not even Roy. I'd never met Ian Wright. Uh, well, no, oh, did, how, many them, how many do you know of? Sorry. Oh, so I, knew, I, I knew of Ian Wright. I knew um, of Kate Garraway. I knew of Kate and Jenna. Um, I didn't know of Adele. I didn't know uh, Roman. I thought, uh, but you know, I thought Roman's dad was uh, Ross Kemp off, off <laughs> a gat, whatever. So when he went, he, 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 we were sitting down one day and he started going, yeah, so um, my dad started DJing. And I was thinking, fuck. Why is Ross Kemp DJ? That guy will do anything, right? <laughs> Thinking about me being a cage fighting by DJ, right? People in glass houses. And then uh, and he goes, yeah, he does these like, 80s nights. I think Ross Kemp's doing 80s nights. <laughs> and I was about to say, and then someone said about Spandau Ballet and then, and then said, oh, your dad. Yeah, yeah. And I went, oh, God. <laughs> Thank God, that could be the worst thing in the world. Then it all dawned on me why his dad was DJing and doing these sellout right. 80s nights and, and everything else. But I came really good mates with Roman. Um, I never watched soap opera, so I didn't know Jacqueline. Um, Andrew, I, uh, I'd seen actually, I think, at, um, uh, at the Apollo or live at the Apollo once. I think I'd seen him. But other than that, no, I didn't really know many of them. Uh, Cliff, I knew as Minty because we've got a guy who used to play with us. At, we called, Nick Easter, we used to call him Minty because he looked the same. But that's about it. Yeah, That's actually true. Nick Easter does look a bit like Minty. He does, and he, and he, and he, and Minty, and he, and he come, I met Minty, Nick's parents once, and they were like, hello, how are you? Like the poshest people in the world. Nick's like, all right, mate, yeah, no, Motley Geese, I've got, and you're like, 
Nick, didn't you go to Dulwich School? Why are you talking like a mockney gangster? Um, but he's like Minty, he? like fixing Charles. You know, don't worry about that. Uh, what was, um, what was, what was like, the greatest experience that you had there on the show as well? The greatest experience? Um... I mean, look, I think I enjoyed the challenges. I enjoyed getting out of camp, bonding with my teammates, going through things. I, la I never laughed so much doing that thing with Ian Wright in that darkened room. Um, it was just ridiculous. You know, um, I think, what else? Uh, just getting to meet people, hang around and sit, you know, sit, in, sit in camp and talking and actually getting opportunities to speak. No phones, no interaction, no nothing. Just honest conversation. Um, and obviously also teaching yourself to avoid you know, certain conversations <laughs> when, when certain people were trying to convince me that Bar Barack Obama was the most corrupt president ever. And I was like, yeah, I'm probably just going to leave this conversation now and not say anything. Um, but also, yeah, but then you're too sad to be filmed. <laughs> It'd be like, James Haskell said. <laughs> yeah, I just, didn't, I just didn't need to, you know, you remember you're on a TV show, you're never going to fix all the problems of the world. However, there was lots of really positive stuff we talked about, gender, sexuality, uh, men opening up, and a lot of that stuff never made the show, which is disappointing mm -hmm. because it was a great platform to actually do some, That's some real thing, yeah. good with, but it just, it obviously not that interesting, so they cut That's it cool. out in replace of putting a spider up someone's arse or whatever happened. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else to say about that, Ross? Any questions about Amsterdam? No, uh, I think that's, that's, that's the jungle covered. Uh, would you do another reality TV show or is that it done? Um, look, well, I never it, depends on, it depends on the money, doesn't it? Mate, cash <laughs> is king. Now, as you said, you know, the world's falling apart. If somebody wants to pay me to fire me out of a cannon, I will 100% do that. Um, it's just, it's interesting. Again, but, you know, it's, look, I think afterwards, in, in, the, in the, raw, the raw moments afterwards, I would have, I would have probably said no, I wouldn't do it. Now I'd say yeah, I'd hundred percent do it. I think it was fun. It was honour, honour to be part of a great show. It's a great show. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I think Strictly's difficult because I think it puts a lot of pressures on relationships. Um, you yeah, know, yeah. Deny all that, but I think it, I think it does. Um, it's very so you intense. Have to be the right show at the right time. So again, it's very intense, isn't it? The... Very intense. You know, you having to, you have to pretend to be sexy with someone. You know, the entire time. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it would be very difficult to avoid that conflict. I think it put pressure on, on your partner and everything else to trust you and vice versa. And, it, you know, look, they say there's no curse of Strictly, but I'm, I'm not adding it up. But there's yeah. more, you know, there's more relationships that have fallen apart there than a divorce committee. So yeah. I don't, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not pointing fingers. But. Yeah. Jay, do you know what I think you'd be brilliant? A league of your own. I think you'd be brilliant on that. So, I, do you know what? I've done that show uh, a couple of times. I would love to have gone and been a panellist. I tell you, I had... Um, so I did a league of their own one. So I went on it and I basically mugged off uh, Freddie Flintoff, right? On a, on a, <laughs> a came on and I did it. And he, he came on. I was doing some juggling thing and he said, I expected more from you. And I just went, well, it's funny enough, Freddie, I watched you box and I expected more from you. I think all the world did. And everyone's like, ah, right? <laughs> so the next, show, the next show they got me on, we had this uh, Freddie. And I, Freddie for me is a hero. Like he's like, um, he's uh, a character and a half. He, 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 England cricket legend, you know, personality, but you know, For amazing example. guy. So I really wanted to like know him. I've never met him before. So he came on the next show and I saw him and, and I was like, um, I hope you're well, mate. Look, it was really nice to meet you. Sorry about last time. Anyway, got on and we're supposed to do a, a, a fake pillow fight. So, but, but Freddie came to me and said, right, let's tell you what we'll do is we'll, uh, I'll push you off early and then uh, you go and push me and push me. We'll have, a, we'll have a fake fight and they'll stop the whole thing. And it'll look quite good. So I, I thought, yeah, didn't say anything to anyone. Was like, okay, anyway, did it. Put, Freddie pushed me off. I square up to him. He pushes me about three or four times. Looks like we have a square off. Looks like, you know, and, and genuinely, I've always wanted to be an actor. I'm not messing around. I could do serious upset. So I was like this, you know, looked at serious. Didn't, obviously, I wouldn't let someone push me over five times without, like, banging him out. So I just didn't do anything. Anyway, they, oh, all the producers came down. Everyone panicked. Stop, 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 stop. And then obviously went lights. I was like, hug Freddie. We're all like, fine. It was a joke. It was his idea. It was a joke. No problem. Anyway, sat back down, did the show. When the show went out, everyone went mad. Freddie Flintoff dished you up. Freddie Flintoff fill you in. You know, you what a mark <laughs> getting angry at you. All this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So I, um, I had to come out and basically... So anyway, so I came out and said at the time, that was a joke. Obviously, all the keyboard warriors. Freddie Flintoff was bad you. And I was like, have you seen him box? I think I'm pretty much... <laughs> um, and they were like saying all this, all this stuff. So I was like trying to be, you know, really respectful. Anyway. The third, then the series after that, he's sitting with Auntie Joshua. They play a clip and they go, they showed a clip of me and he went, yeah, James Haskell, bit of a dick, right? 
and, and completely made out that I'd actually lost my temper, that it wasn't his idea and mugged me off. So much so that Anthony Joshua was like laughing. And I saw Anthony Joshua at an event and he, he went, oh, I've seen you on TV. So you got angry with Freddie Flintoff. And I said, listen, Anthony, if you weren't heavyweight champion in the world and about five times bigger than me, I'd fill you in. And we just like laughed. And that's how we kind of, we, 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 we bonded. I, I saw you laughing. Don't think I didn't fucking see you laughing at me. Um, but he was like, and I said, no, I told him the story. It was all fake. So I, I've never been since invited back on a league of their own since then um so i don't think i ever will be because i obviously upset one of the the main stars and and you know maybe too much personality i don't know yeah. well in fairness your, your rugby podcast is really kicking off as well yeah that's gone that's mad i mean we get three hundred thousand um an episode listening we, we just turned over 11 million subscribers or viewers or whatever it is across the thing so no we had way. something like 55 million minutes watched or something like that. It's, you know, from something that started as nothing and rugby's a relatively small sport, it's, yeah. um, it's gone pretty wild. That's cool, man. Yeah, Is anyone you on, on there? That was just a garble of Irish, that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, Barry said he was subscribed. I just want to know, who's your dream guest to have on the show? Oh, I mean, look, I, I, you know, I, rugby, I think, is great, but I would love to get a Ricky Gervais on, a Rock, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, I want real personalities. You know, we obviously... I want to diversify and get some more celebrities and different people on there. Um, you know, but people panic because we don't talk about any rugby, but everyone thinks you've got to know about rugby. And we're like, no, no, we don't want anybody, that, you know, doesn't know anything. We, we want to get MVP on there as well. But, you know, we've, it's probably because it's sponsored by Guinness. We've got, we've got to adhere to some of the stuff that they say. But yeah. I ultimately, you know, we want to expand. And, and as it gets bigger and bigger, we'll try to get more and more, you know, celebrities on there, I think. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a really good format the way you have. It's like a lads locker room sort of thing, you know. So I think any yeah. rugby player or even person who was part of a team would really like enjoy it, you know. I hope so, because also we're trying to get much more women on on the on the on the podcast as well, female rugby players. But you know, things like the, the, the you know the RFU are so precious about the women. We're like we've got a massive platform that gets more viewers than one of your games. Let us let's talk on there. Let's do it. But they're all like you know lock them down. It's just. You know, we want to open the doors to get give people opportunity to be to be positive and have fun and, and everything else. And you don't need to talk about rugby. We want to know about the people. We want to know about the stories. Exactly. That, you know the, the you know behind the rugby players. We don't want people who aren't going to come and say anything because there's no point. You know, we're not. You know, you could be open on that format. We're not going to stitch you up if you say something really awkward. We'll take it out. It's just about being you know having fun really. Yeah. I, well, I think yeah. as soon as someone retires as well, like they're, like they're far more willing to come on and like tell the truth as opposed to. When they're still playing in the game, they're afraid to offend someone. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, you know, that's always the way. I mean, look, I, you know, I've, you know, I've retired, and my my objective is never to to mug any of my fellow teammates off or players off, uh, because I don't, you know, I make tongue in cheek jokes about it, but I don't want to attack people because it's not what I'm about. Yeah. Well, here, look, we may as well get into your rugby career. Obviously, you started off with London Wasps, and then you you were currently you were playing for them when you first made your England debut in 2007. Um, what was that like when you got your first call up for England? Yeah, amazing. Look, it was well. You think it was going to be amazing, but actually, um, it. Well, I, I basically only found out I was involved because an ex team of mine, as I was driving out of the car park, twenty one shouted, "Oh, it has school, you dick!" <laughs> <laughs> I looked up and he went, "Oh, check your email, check your email." <laughs> so I was like, uh, "Right, I mean, obviously." So that was brilliant. Like, that was brilliant. <laughs> When I was 21, right, I had like a, you know, I had a Hotmail account. I think it was like Top Shagger at Hotmail.com or something like that. <laughs> you know, like a really embarrassing email that you used to have as a kid. You thought was really funny. I mean, the fact it turned out to be true is, is neither here nor there. But um, I had, uh, I had the email, and the bloke, you know, lo and behold, on the bottom of an email trail of like Lawrence Delalio, you know, uh, Josh Johnny Wilkins, and everything else, that Top Shagger at Hotmail.com, uh, you've been invited to the England camp. No one called me up. No one said welcome to the squad. I just and I was told to report to Bath on a Sunday Sunday afternoon. So um, under Eddie Jones, things have, have changed dramatically. But um, it was yeah, uh, it was it was interesting and obviously very exciting. You know, Nick Easter was touch and go whether he was going to be able to to play, and I ended up starting eight with um, Joe. Wer sorry, starting <laughs> six with Joe Worsley, Lawrence Delalio, and myself all in the one back row. Yeah, was that in Twickenham? No, that was in Wales at the Millennium Stadium, probably. The, the biggest rugby cauldron ever. You know, everybody talks about crowds and, you know, the impact they have. And, for example, Twickenham's an amazing place, my favourite place to go and play. But the, quiet, the crowd can be quite quiet. They can be okay. quite um, quite corporate. Yeah. And if you're going well, they're singing. But if things aren't going well, they can be, you know, they're a bit lost. But I think that's the kind of nature of English sport. Whereas, 
not less English football, but every other sport, you know, like things like uh, rugby, because you know, the Irish have their identity, the Welsh have their identity, you know, Scottish have their ident identity. All of you are united in the fact you hate the English. The English don't hate anyone and are kind of apologetic for like 700 years of empire building. And, you know, if you wear a St George's flag, you're a leader of the BNP. So it's very difficult to be nationalistic when you're English because, you know, so Twickenham will be quite quiet, but Millennium Stadium, the crowd, you know, we were, we were, ten, we were five points down, five metres from the line, and this crowd was so loud with the roof closed. It was like someone pushing down on your head. It like pervaded every every one of your senses. It was so hard to focus and concentrate. It was the most intense thing. Um, but I absolutely loved it and realised that this is what you know sacrifice and, and everything else was worth worth yeah. giving up um, for, and that I was so keen to, to to carry on doing it. And what was it like the first time I you played Twickenham? Hello. What was it like the first time you you played in Twickenham? Yeah, I mean Twickenham again. Was, so I didn't get to play at Twickenham until a warm up game for the 2007 World Cup, um, and I started six with Lawrence and. Um, not sure who was playing seven that day. But it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience to um, to actually get out of Twickenham. Uh, you know, the, the sights, smells, sounds of Twickenham are, are part of my childhood. You know, I went there for a few games. I watched wasps play there. You know, it's it's the ultimate ground for me to play at, um, and it was just the best feeling to go out there. Sadly, we lost because um, old Sebastian Chabal came on came on and ran over the top of Nick Abendon. Yeah. That ended Nick Abendon's World Cup. Uh, that's why that's why Ross grew, grew his beard, Chabal. Yeah, is that <laughs> right? Lovely. Yeah, I like it. Well, not really, but like, why not? <laughs> why not? Why not? Why not? Uh, uh, come here, James. You touched on something there that I've actually never heard some English rugby say that you're right. All the other Six Nations teams really want to beat England. It's like they're they're a big game. Do you feel that pressure? Because when we were at we were at Ireland versus Scotland in Murrayfield last year, and Ireland won. And the Scottish guys in the crowd sitting in front of us started sing, chanting, we hate England more than you. I was just wondering, is, is that well known throughout the English camp? That, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, everyone's yeah. out to get us? Yes, I mean, look, everybody, bizarrely, everyone le le levels up the English as arrogant. We're not at all. You know, some of the stuff that I've, I've had to put up from other teams mm -hmm. and the way people conduct themselves. But we're afforded that because of, you know, Think because of empire building, because we used to run lots of places, because we used to, you know, uh, invade, etc., and, and do everything else. Everyone's united in our hatred. You know, we are the big, the big country with a big budget, with a bit, lots of players that, that people want to beat. And and, it, and it's very true. You know, if you any other, any other game of Six Nations, but you beat England, because Six Nations is is well done. You know, Wales had that that year. They destroyed us in the Grand Slam, thirty eight points to something. They lost every game, or, or they lost a load of games. Felt you know played pretty badly, and. Um, went on to beat us and, and, and you know, and ultimately, um, I don't know if they actually beat us to go and do something with the six there, whether they actually won it. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was, it was you know, their big moment. All they cared about was beating us. And, um, you know, I, it, it just happens. But you get used to it. I mean, I don't, you know, what's interesting when journalists and people ask us about, ask us about it, you know, they always say, well, and, and you're like, listen, I'm a, I'm a sports person. I don't hate anybody. I hate losing. I hate coming off second best. And I hate playing badly. Who I'm playing against? If they're, if they're nice people, they're nice people. I don't see race. I don't see color. I don't give a shit. It's it's um it's just down to that. So I don't want to beat anyone more or less than anyone. I just want to beat everybody. Yeah. Would you feel any of that? Would there be any animosity in that uh, the British and Lions squad you're in? No. I mean, well, interesting enough. Look, everybody that comes on our podcast says, you know, I wanted to punch James Haskell before I met him. I thought he was a dick. I didn't like him. And then. All of them turned around and said, actually, they found out, you know, I was a good gloat. They absolutely loved me. We're friends for life. Whatever it might be, we got on really well. Um, and I was completely different to what they expected. On that Lions tour, I think loads of people thought that was going to be the case. But actually, I got on with everybody, you know, on that tour. And I think generally you can have separate groups. Like, you know, when the Leicester players used to be on those um, groups with England, they um, used to always stick together. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think the English could, be, could sometimes be seen to be difficult. But actually, on our tour... Everyone got like a house on fire. I was in the midweek team or the midweek veg, as we called ourselves. And, and um, you know, we kept everyone, uh, I kept everyone really happy. And, and that was my role. And I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Just I believe you were room, sorry, I believe you were room with uh, Sean O'Brien there. Yes. What was that like? Uh, uh, eye opening. Um, I mean, the fact that, you know, he thought that all the, all the stuff, all of my stuff was his stuff. So when my <laughs> wife sent me some treats and everything else, that he opened. He just opened and started eating the Ferrero Rocher. <laughs> uh, so I, I love how she sent me Ferrero Rocher as well, just in case the ambassador was coming around. Um, and he sent, sent it to me. And, um, you know, and I was like, what are you doing, Sean? He's like, room treats, room treats. I was like, 
There's no such thing as room treats, you thieving fuck. So um, he was brilliant, though. I loved him. He was someone that I always wanted to to meet and get to know. He was somebody that I really admired and wanted and, and hoped would be um, like an English version of me. I wanted him to be that. But you know, he was lovely. Taught me loads of farmer songs. Um, you know, was yeah, was he was he was he was a great character. I absolutely loved him. He loves to drink that fella as well. There's no stopping him once he gets on it. Nah, he's he, yeah, he, he can he can go big when he's on it, but he's obviously very, very professional a lot of the time. But he was great to share a room with. Loves a Guinness, uh, James. Just something Love. you touched on there about Leicester. Uh, You're saying that in the English squad, some some players they, like had their own little uh, cliques almost. Yeah. Did you, was that was it like that the whole way through your career, or as things went on through the years, that did did you become more of a unit? Because in the football, no, the English no, football no. team had that problem. And now they're all, they all seem to be very, very close. No, we all, no, we all got on. We, all, we never had any clicks. The less boys just had their own click for no other reason than they didn't seem to be able to operate without each other holding, holding their hands. But that was, you know, as less Leicester players got involved in the squad, that was, that was not the case. They're all still good lads and, and played very hard and, and worked, you know, worked with intensity. But they were like the Borg from Star, Star, uh, Star Trek. They had like one mind and they, they, they went to breakfast together, lunch together, went out together, did everything together. And I've never planned to go and meet anyone for lunch. I mean, most people try to avoid me at best of time. So you just to see them together. And I was like, how are they doing? Who's running the admin on this group of like robots that just go around, you know, together? It was, um, it was bizarre. And it used to cause you know, a bit of friction because the lads were like no cliques and then all the Leicester boys would just stay together. Yeah, but, I say, I say it's know, hard not to because like Leicester were great then as well, weren't they? Yeah, but I, I, yeah, also, yeah, and they did, and they, they started together, and then that kind of followed in for the younger players and stuff. But actually, now it's very different. Now there aren't any cliques at all. Obviously, you've got mates who you prefer to spend time yeah. with. You know, there's always a few weird fish that you want to avoid. But I was easy, man. I don't have any, you know, hang ups. I used to wind academy players up, pretend I didn't know their names, and, you know, <laughs> give them shit and stuff. But I, you know, I would, I was never too big to talk to anyone. I'd sit with, I'd sit with anyone, anytime, on any table. I never planned it, and I, and I, and I loved it, and I was, you know, I never not tried to be bigger than anyone. That's a good way to be. You seem like a larger than life character. But James, I'm just looking at your, your career here. You, went, you then moved from uh, in 2009 to Stab from, say, then you moved, uh, then you went to Japan, Japan, and then you went to New Zealand. Uh, how, did, how did all these tra- like moves come about? So, um, with Wasps, basically, um, I spent two years trying to negotiate a contract with them. Uh, they, were, they basically, back in the day, used to underpay everybody um, and because you used to win trophies, that's how they kept you there. I mean, they paid some of their big timers like Lawrence, but they told everyone else, you know, if you want to be winning stuff, you come here. So people used to take less money to come to Wasps to win. Okay, Wasps, you know, infrastructure business was pretty terrible off the field. So they were trying to mug me off. I was playing for England. I was the lowest paid England player by a long way um, and, you know, tried to get the situation. They tried to play hardball. Then a new owner came in and basically... <laughs> offered a sealed envelopes with offers, non-negotiable, no agents fees, nothing. So I was like, yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, it was like way less than it taken two years to get to. So I then basically um, went, uh, started talking to other teams, got an opportunity to speak to Stade Francais, you know, and was like, A, what a team, B, how much they actually pay, what your market value is, and C, what an opportunity to live in the heart of Paris, playing for a, one of the best teams that plays five games a season at the Stade de France with one of the most flamboyant owners in the game, with Sergio Parise, Dimitri Sarzescu, Julien Dupuy, you know, to name a few. It was, yeah. um, it was a, an opportunity I couldn't change. And everyone was like, you shouldn't leave Wasps, you're never going to make it, you're never going to um, amount to anything, nobody leaves Wasps. People told me I was money-grabbing, I was arsehole, everything else. And uh, I went there and I never missed an England game and I had the time of life and I wanted to stay there longer, but they were in real financial, financial trouble by the end of it and they let five or six of us go. So I wanted to then go and explore for Super 15, uh, there was absolutely no money in Super 15, um, so that's why you go to Japan, because the seasons start differently, so I got an opportunity to go to Japan, and you know, we saw for the World Cup what a country it is, Tokyo is the best city in the world, it was an absolute yeah. island of a place, um, and I absolutely loved it, I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, you're only there for a year, and then you moved to New Zealand for a year with players. I moved to New Zealand. I left. I left Japan on a Wednesday, trained on a Thursday, did a team run on a Friday, played on a Saturday for the Highlanders. Came off the bench, and then, uh, but what, where, where did you prefer living, New Zealand or Tokyo? No, I mean, look, all of it's so different. I think most of these places were, you know, so unique. Like Japan, culturally incredible. You know, obviously very different than France. You know, all the like, European languages based on Latin. You can find your way. Similar words in Japan. Right, if you get lost in Japan, you'll still be lost now. I was whizzing around a subway for about six hours once. I couldn't get off it. And, <laughs> I say everyone's and everyone I asked was like, 
everyone was like, asking, they go like this, they go like, no, sorry, I can't talk to you. And you're like, ah, and some, luckily I saw some white guys, you know, foreigners, they call them, and they uh, showed me out and I managed to escape. Um, and then, you know, New Zealand was, was the rugby heartland. New Zealand was a place where everybody talks about rugby. Everybody thinks about rugby. If you're an all-black, it's the greatest thing. Rugby in the UK is, is the third, third tier sport. You know, uh, everyone wants to be a reality TV star or a, or a footballer over in the UK. In New Zealand, you know, uh, if you play football, there's something wrong with you. People want to be rugby players. Everyone wants to be an all-black. And I wanted to go there and see, test my skills, see whether I could, I could survive. And I got to play under one of the best coaches I've ever worked with, Jamie Joseph. Um, I lived right by the sea. Uh, we travelled all around the place and I, I absolutely loved it. And I, and I wanted to stay and play longer. But unfortunately, um, I'd already signed with Wasp. And uh, obviously, I went. I mean, I luckily went back to Was, and we, we you know, we went on a, on a quite a big journey. Even though we had yeah. real financial difficulties, kind of quite nightmarish situations with not being paid, and you know, the club's going to fold at any moment. And then, and Derek Richardson came in and saved the day. And then things fell apart towards the end. And and, and I finished off in Northampton, where you know, uh, I wanted to finish at Was. They didn't offer me a contract. weren't interested in having me. So I went to Northampton. Hampton and open with welcome up, you know, open arms. A lot of the fans were mixed. They, you know, they thought I was being paid a lot of money. I wasn't. I was on the same amount of money I was on when I was 21. And, you know, they didn't really like me, a lot of them. But actually, hopefully I won them over. I only got to play five games before, unfortunately, my body gave up in that respect. Yeah. Well, you came home, basically. Yeah. I mean, well, um, I mean, actually, I was born in Windsor, so I'm, I'm no, I've never been anywhere near in the Midlands. I didn't, this, this, ha I'm only here because Wasp moved up from High Wycombe to Coventry and now I'm, uh, I'm here, but I actually ended up moving around the, you know, around the corner uh, about five years ago, and it's the same house I had when I'm Northampton. So I'm still there now. I'm obviously looking to, to move at some point because uh, everything I do is now in, in London. You know, I was commuting four hours a day with the MMA stuff, which was killing me. Yeah. Uh, before we get James, tell us this. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to ask uh, James. We asked Tommy Bow who his uh, or who the best player was he ever played with. So we want to know who's the best player James Haskell's ever played with, and then who's the best player you've ever played against. I'd say Jason Robinson, uh, and I would say either Brian O'Driscoll or um, someone like Joe Rockathoco. Very fast. Nice. Oh, oh, always pick the backs. They must have been too hard to catch. Yeah, very much so. They, you know, I mean, listen, there's, you know, Skulk Brits had some footwork like a back, but most most don't, you know. Yeah. What about the greatest captain you played under? Uh, I think it's tied between Lawrence Delaney and Dylan Hartley. I think both of them were brilliant in very different ways. Yeah. Controversial, but fair. We'll give it to you. You played with them, so <laughs> we'll yeah, give yeah, it to yeah. you. Thank and you very just... much for giving it on my own decision. That's very kind of you. Uh, oh, well, we, we try to be nice over here, Energize, you know. <laughs> yeah. James, just before we wrap the rugby up, uh, what was your proudest moment as well in your whole playing career? Um... I think winning the Grand Slam, you know, uh, is so hard to do. We failed three other times, fourth time lucky, um, you know, to get the opportunity and to do it and to not be taken away and have been criticised so heavily and been told that me and Chris Robshaw weren't, you know, six and sevens and all this crap that went with it. It was great to, to win it and, and have that, you know, be, be bonding and never, ever have it taken away from you. That's great. Brilliant. That's great. And now, now you've, uh, you've signed with Bellator. Um, it looks like you're going to be on the 5th of May cars. I think it's 5th of May with James Gallagher headline 16, sorry. Uh, and it, as things stand, it, it probably won't go ahead if, you, if we're being brutally honest. Uh, do you think that could be a blessing in disguise that you get more hours under your belt training and then we'll see a better version of James Haskell show up when you do make your Bellator debut? Yeah, I hope so. It's just obviously depending on how long this goes because I can't train with anyone. So you can't, it's very mm. difficult. You know, I was, I was getting some real sustained training. I was in five, six days a week. Um, fires. You know, I was heavy sparring. I was doing everything. We were about to have our first kind of uh, guest spar come in. Um, and, and, you know, I've had an MMA spar. I've done quite a lot of stuff that I was getting on. But, but the injury was a, was a real issue um, that came about, which kind of put a span in the works. I mean, it's not... You know, I don't really know anyone. I haven't told anyone about it, essentially. So, you know, you guys know that. But it's just, just put a bit of pressure on things. But then this whole quarantine thing's come about. And I don't know. You know, I, I just, it's a very weird situation to be in. Um, so we'll have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, James, uh, sorry for asking. Could, could you move a bit closer to the mic as well? Oh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Uh, James, yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from there. And because of what everyone's, everything's going on, we don't know when you're actually going to make your debut. Well, how did you actually start getting into MMA? Because a lot of people were very interested about that. 
So I, I always basically worked with London Shoot Fighters. I've known the guys since I was 17. I used to go and see Paul Ivans to do uh, wrestling and tackle technique stuff. So we would practice tackling, practice um, running the pipe, double leg takedowns, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, wrestling, how to get out of tight things, how to use your body, how to use levers, etc. Uh, I would often do a bit of extra boxing. And I, I was probably doing that, you know, once a week for a period of time. Um, as I got older and I was unable to kind of sustain doing loads of extra stuff outside training, when I got asked about the MMA stuff through from David Green, um, it's obviously well documented. I thought they were asking me to do some commentary stuff and they offered me to fight. I f first people I talked, I called up were shoot fighters and said, listen, um, you know, is this, am I being stupid? What do you think of this? Could you coach me? If you guys agree, then I'll do it. They were like, yeah, absolutely. And, and I basically never, never looked back. You know, I've done a bit of jiu-jitsu. I did a lot of jiu-jitsu when I was in, in New Zealand. But, you know, again, all this stuff, you can do it for, you know, two or three years and still be nowhere down the path. So, um, yeah. I, you know, I think when I finished all this fighting and all the rest of it, I'm definitely going to carry on the jiu-jitsu part of it. I really enjoy it. I think it's, um, I think it's very special and uh, I think it's a great, um, a great sport. Yeah, but well, the thing is about heavyweight, you can go on for much longer. Like it says here now, you're 34. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so you, you definitely have a couple, of, like a, at least a couple of years to like really put your name on the on the map. Uh, when Bellator well, announced we'll you were coming on, we we were totally shocked that you were you were going up. Where were you, Ross? Yeah, it was it was it was it was incredible to see. But I was like, if anyone was going to do it, like a crossover athlete like yourself could definitely be it. I feel at heavyweights, you know what I mean. Your athletic prowess can actually, you know, push the gap a lot sooner in terms of skill wise because. You see some heavyweights like you don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but like if you look at Roy Nelson, you, you don't go scream athlete as opposed to when James Haskell takes his top off, you're like, right, well, I think you know he looks like a bit of a physical specimen to start off with. Yes, but I mean, as we all know, you know, I go, you know, the thing is when you go to shoot fighters, you know, uh, you know everyone could fill me in in there, including the seven year old cleaner. You know, it, 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 <laughs> what you look like, what you look like doesn't really mm. doesn't equate to anything, um, and you know. Uh, Fighting is, you know, it's a completely different mindset to anything mm. else. You know, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, emotionally, it's very hard to physically peak, you know, every day in rugby, you peak, you know, uh, once a week or, or twice a week. Here, you know, you're, you're having to go in there, punch your teammates in the face, they're going to punch you in the face, and then you've got to go again and keep turning up and doing that. And, you know, there's always that overthinking, that slight bit of fear in your belly. It's a really interesting uh, experience, you know. Um, and I think... Look, my ambitions are to get to that first fight and, and, and to do that and, and to fight, you know, and the rest of it, we, we will see. You know, I, I've made no promises about anything that I want to achieve. You know, it's, it's a hard ask. You know, my body, you know, I played in a very, very attritional position um, as a back row player at an international level from 21 to 34, essentially. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a very hard thing. You, the MMA is the hardest sport. You know, it, the skill required, the different levels, the different techniques, the different abilities, uh, the toll it takes in your body is is second to none, really. Uh, and I walk out of that place, as you saw in my wife's photo, unable to walk, talk, um, and then I have to wake up the next day and go again. And you know, and as Paul at Shoot Fighters told me, uh, you know, they ran out of cotton wool a long time ago down there. So you know, nobody's getting uh, preferential treatment. Yeah, I told you you'd even want that anyway. Second. I doubt you'd even want the preferential treatment anyway. No, no, of course I wouldn't. No, no, you wouldn't. I, I just I just mean, you know, it, it's one of those things. I've known these guys, but if you come in, you're like, how are your back sore? Your arms are sore. My arm, I can't straighten my arms. I can't do next to go. And they're like, yeah, okay, just go and train. You're like, oh, okay, fine, fine. It's like, you know what I mean? I, it, it, it's quite a humbling thing, really, because uh, I've done some no-gi jiu-jitsu classes, and when you have someone who's like 30 kilos lighter, then you turn you into an absolute pretzel. You're just like, all right. So, like, it makes you feel actually quite vulnerable, to be honest. Um, was that like a bit of a, a bitter pill to swallow for you or were you aware of that when you were going into it? I was aware of that. I learned that early on when my mate, I was 20 and me and my mate, uh, best mate Paul Dawn Jones went down to London Shoot Fires when it was under the arches and uh, we went down to some wrestling and Alexis said, right, I want you to go in this cage, wrestle this guy. He's, he's about 50 kgs um, uh, and I was, uh, I was something like 110 uh, Dozer was about 118 and I went right I just wrestled him I said what do you want he said no punch no thing just try and get him down so I went to get him down grabbed him he took my back pulled me on the floor I was like oh, okay so when I go again he did a single leg um, uh, shoot on me and tackled me to the floor and I didn't get a hand on him and he was like 50 kgs and I was like this is embarrassing sent, sent my mate Dozer in 
The bloke, uh, single leg underneath him, picked Dozer up above his head and just stuffed him into the side of the cage. And Alexis came in and was like, right, guys, if that doesn't show you that technique wins over, uh, over size any day of the week. So then from that moment on, when any little bloke or anybody bumps into me, I'm always the first to say, sorry, apologize, no ego. I didn't have any illusions that I couldn't get folded up very, very quickly in, in, um, you know, in there. I mean, I just look at, you know, look at Paul. You know, Paul's my size and he's incredibly dangerous to coach. Alexis is probably one of the most dangerous people I've ever, ever met in terms of his fighting ability and his temperament and how he is. Like, I reckon if he wanted to fight me, I think I'd probably just lay on the floor and just apologise. <laughs> Uh, what's it like sparring Michael Venom Page? <laughs> Mate, they do not let me anywhere, or, or I should say, they do not let him anywhere near me. Uh, you know, he, A, I mean, I, I asked him, I said, well, you know, joking, I said, I obviously don't want to do this. I said to him, you know, what, what would happen if I tried to fight? He goes, to be honest with you, I don't think you'd lay a hand on him. And also, you'd, the problem is, is that you'd walk into his punches. So you go to sets, throw something, and just walk straight into one of his one of his punches, like he does. You know, you saw the way his last fight when that guy teed up, and he just goes whoa, boom. Uh, yeah, they don't let me anywhere near it. So we do. I, I wrestle with him. We do jujitsu together. No sparring, mate. He is. He does stuff that I might as well. When I saw it, I was like, I probably just should retire now before I've even fought. It's just no point. But then I realised it, he's not not in anywhere near my division. I don't have to fight anyone who can do anything like that. Thank God. He's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. Must see TV. We previously had him on the show as well. I think I mentioned it earlier, but uh, like he's extremely humble and he's a great lad. Hey, he's, he's a great guy, really humble, really lovely. Um, all the guys at Shoot Fighters are, to be honest with you. You know, Norbert, um, you know, Michael Shipman, uh, Felix uh, Flexhammer, uh, you know, Javid. Um, you know, all these guys are, are Farad. All these blokes are, are really, really good. You know, Carlos. You know, he gives me time. Uh, Aaron, as all these guys are really kind and, and, and uh, offer things up. Deadly, but kind. And James, do you have a name for your opponent yet? Not yet. No, I haven't. I haven't looked. I haven't bothered to pay any attention to that. As soon as shoot fighters know, they'll they'll let me know. I'm not sure who it would be at the moment. And I'm sure you probably have loads of people calling you out on Twitter and stuff. Do you? Oh, mate, I've been called up. I've been called up about like 10 old rugby players, you know, some South African rugby players, and loads of people. I just ignore it. I just I don't know anything about it. It's like. I just no point. I don't know enough about who I'm fighting. You know, everybody talks of a big game, and the psychological battle in fighting is is so is so important. You know, you, the guy could look a million dollars and be an absolute fanny. So it's best not just to, to ever look into it. And James, is your is your skill more so on the ground than on the feet, or where where do you think you're at your best? Um. Well, look, you know, with shoot fighters, you know, you're covering everything off. I, I wouldn't say, look, I, I don't think I've been doing it long enough to say where I'm best at. I think. Um, Okay, where are you least worst? Least worst. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think you know, on my feet and stuff like that. I think you know, look, there's always, you know, the thing with it, transition periods is probably where it's, you know, is 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 the most difficult area. You know, when you're moving something, trying to get out of something, not exposing yourself to a guillotine or whatever it might be, um, you know, an ankle lock or a leg lock. Those, those things are, I find difficult. Being on my feet, takedowns, you know, dealing with stuff on the on the floor within reason, I'm okay. You know. Getting trapped, getting you know, getting caught in a crucifix by by Carlos, and you know it, it's probably not a place you want to be. And I've ended up being there. And luckily, you couldn't elbow; otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here today. Right. Well, don't fight, fight Roy Nelson. Like he's the master of the crucifix. So don't fight him. That's my advice to you. Right, fine. Well, I don't. I mean, look. I think it'd be very simple when people got all, all heads up. This is incremental. You know, this is my first yeah. first fight ever. You know, people are going, "Well, you get filled in." Look, if Bellator want to stick me in with. with with Vader and watch me get absolutely filled in or check Congo. It's not going to be a great, great career move because I can honestly tell you they are going to beat me. I'll, I'll give it my best shot, but I'll get kicked in the head and folded up. It doesn't really serve anyone any purpose. So hopefully yeah. it will be a process where, you know, as we move up, we, we, we fight people of my level, etc. Would, yeah. would your would your anti wrestling be be like quite high because of your background in rugby as well, or? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, ability to, over. Ability, yeah, ability to sprawl and things like that. Yeah, I'm used to that that kind of stuff. That comes kind of re relatively naturally to me. Um, you know, again, you know, I, 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 they obviously threw me in the deep end shoot fights to make sure a I wasn't a pussy and could take a punch and, and you know wasn't you know everything else. So that's all come out of it. I've come out of it okay. Turns out I don't mind getting <laughs> getting hit. Um, and uh, you know I don't mind a scrap. Nice one. Oh, I I think like the big sort of money fight for you, maybe in two or three time, uh, two or three fights times, maybe uh, Jack Swagger or Jack Hager or whatever he's called. You know the funny who did WWE? 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like People have talked about it, yeah. Yeah, because I think that's sort of like both have big crossover uh, startups. So I, I, like, I think that one could be a big one. But I think if you go over to America, people might not really know who you are. And if he comes over here, I don't know if people will know who he is. I don't know whether he's like a big name in the, the UK w- or not. But like, well, the WWE uh, fans are definitely know. WWE fans are definitely know. Is there a lot yeah, of WWE fans in the UK? Yeah, I'm not a massive fan of WWE. My, 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 one of my teammates, Alex Corbacero, who I used to play with, absolutely loved it. Like lives and breathes it, knew everything about it. I mean, someone said I should cross over to that next and become a WWE wrestler. Yeah. Would you give that a go? <laughs> Mate, listen, at the moment I'm unemployed, cash is king. <laughs> Re- WrestleMania is coming up soon, so WrestleMania is coming up soon. I, I just don't go. think I've got the acrobatics though. I ain't backflipping off a top row. I can't backflip. You know, I'm one of one of the people in life who backflips into a pool or runs in and just falls into it. That, that I'm the, the, the latter. Yeah, maybe it could be like something enforcer on the outside. You don't actually have to do too much. Yeah, fine, I can do that. There we go. Yeah, I can see, mock, I, can mock, I can mock beat someone up and hit someone with a chair. I don't care. Yeah, James. Also, yeah. are you going to have a nickname going in, like James the Rascal? No, Rascal? no, no, no. no. <laughs> the Rascal. <laughs> no crap nicknames, lads. No nothing. I'm just going to go. Um, it is James Haskell. That's all you need. Yeah, you, I'm sure you're going to have loads of people tuning in when this actually goes down. Uh, like, I don't know what the situation is now with London. Do you, do you think they're going to reschedule for London and put, put your debut until then? Or do you think you could end up playing I, have, I have no correspondence. I have no idea. I'm just, I'm just waiting to see what the story is, really. I think, I think there's a few shows before that, though. I think they're, they're looking at. I think there's one or two April shows that they have to decide whether they're moving them or not. Uh, just on your debut, do you, have your, do you have your walkout song picked out yet? Um, I was thinking about that the other day, actually, because uh, somebody asked me and I hadn't thought of it. Yeah, probably. Be, yeah, I, I, I don't. Might know be one of your own tunes. You might. Yeah, no, a DJ Haskell remix. I wish. I wish. No, no, no. It might be rhythm of the dance or something. I don't know. I don't know what I'll put in. Um, but we'll, we'll have a. We'll have a. Yeah, we'll have a, I'll, I'll, Look, these little things are part of the circus that you don't worry about. I'll, yeah. I'll worry about that near the time. Yeah. Well, do me one favor. Make sure not to do the thing Deontay Wilder did and wear like a thirty pound gown. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I was already taking notes if I get banged out. That was being my excuse. I was going to turn up dressed as a transformer <laughs> and just claim my, uh, you know. You were tired. Yeah, my legs were, my legs were shot. Perfect. Well, James, yeah, yeah, well, really I don't think you have that excuse. <laughs> James, yeah, we really yeah, looking forward to it as well. So. Really Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. But Ross, have you got anything else to say before we wrap it up? No, James, thanks a million for coming on. Uh, you were our king of the jungle. And uh, we were actually very, very excited for you to debut in Bellator. Uh, congrats on the success of the podcast. And hopefully that keeps on going. Cheers, lads. Stay energised and thanks for having me on. Stay energised. Oh, you, you actually finished the show for us. <laughs> You're an yeah. absolute legend. Yeah, make sure to check out James when he makes his debut. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe. And as always, stay energised.